how fast fortunes can change for the United Kingdom. One week ago, the whole world was honoring the late queen and a constitutional monarchy hailed as one of a kind. Now there's a run on the pound. There you saw those images that seemed like they were yesterday. Now there's a run on the pound and the panic in the markets over the UK's biggest tax cut for the rich in half a century. New Prime Minister Liz Truss so those... taking the concept of going for broke to a whole new level with an almighty gamble that the deficit will take care of itself once all that investment pours in. But rather than reassure, say investors, they are spooked. The International Monetary Fund weighing in as the Bank of England hints at more rate hikes and British banks suspend new mortgage offers to homeowners. Some evoke 1976, when the IMF had to bail out uh, the UK, a humiliation for a Britain under Labour rule. The backlash would come in the form of Britain's first female prime minister three years later. Why does Liz Truss and those who back her think they can channel the spirit of Margaret Thatcher in 2022? Will they really double down? What are the options for post-Brexit Britain? Today in the France 24 debate, uh, we're looking at Liz Truss's uh, gamble on supply-side economics. Joining us from Eastbourne, England, Tim Bale, professor of politics at Queen Mary University, London. Uh, your upcoming book the next spring, The Conservative Party After Brexit, Turmoil and Transformation. Thanks for joining us. Good to be here. From Glasgow, Gregor Irwin, chief economist at the Global Council, former chief economist at the British Foreign Ministry. Welcome back to the show. Good evening. From Birmingham, Jake Scott, researcher at the University of Birmingham. Thanks for being with us. Thank you very much for having me. And we're joined by economist Catherine Mathieu of the OFCE Think Tank. Good evening. Nice to see you. The uh, France 24 debate where you can join the conversation you have on Facebook and Twitter. Hashtag F24 debate. Let's begin with the latest. The Bank of England has stepped in this Wednesday, easing stress on borrowing costs after it announced it would buy up to five billion pounds worth of bonds a day. That's crucial for UK homeowners who face the prospect of mortgage rates shooting up. Uh, also watching Britain's pensions regulator, which says it's monitoring financial uh, markets. The pound rebounding slightly after uh, the intervention to uh, $1.08 in late trading. All the uncertainty, uh, though you can see that's the longer term trend. Uh, uh, all the uncertainty goes back to last week and that fateful decision by Liz Truss's government. Emerald Maxwell explains. I now call the Chancellor of the Exchequer to make a statement. Chancellor. Facing record inflation and a looming recession, British Chancellor Kwasi Kwarten has announced the biggest tax cuts since 1988 in a stated bid to double the UK's annual economic growth to 2.5 per cent. On top of the estimated £60 billion already promised towards subsidising energy bills for households and businesses for the next six months, the finance minister said he was scrapping a planned rise in corporation tax, reversing a national insurance increase and cutting stamp duty, a tax on house purchases. He will also scrap the cap on bankers' bonuses to boost London's post-Brexit competitiveness against other financial capitals. We need global banks to create jobs here, invest here and pay taxes here in London. In London, not in Paris, not in Frankfurt and not in New York. In the biggest surprise, Quarton said the government will scrap the 45% top rate of income tax, replacing it with a 40% rate, and cut the basic rate of income tax from 20 to 19% a year earlier than previously promised. He also said the government would tighten strike rules, requiring pay offers to be put to members during negotiations. It's a package of tax breaks set to benefit high earners most, with a hefty bill funded by a sharp rise in borrowing. The Chancellor's statement comes a day after the Bank of England raised its interest rate to 2.25 per cent. The opposition Labour Party is calling the plan a gamble and said the government was prioritising big business over working people by relying on trickle-down economics. Uh, Gregor Irwin, uh, that was announced last week. Uh, we've seen uh, the reaction since, uh, new lows in the pound since the, uh, the 1970s. Did the government know it would be in for this? 
Uh, well, I don't think the government anticipated the market reaction uh, that we have seen. It's clearly more severe than the government was expecting. H having said that, the government was warned. A number of people were um, saying last week before we heard the Chancellor's announcement that the government was set on a collision course with the Bank of England. The government obviously wanting to launch an expansionary fiscal policy at a time when the Bank of England has to tighten monetary policy. That doesn't make a lot of sense. On top of that, the government um, set out uh, a number of tax cuts without um, explaining what the longer term plan was for borrowing and for fiscal policy, and um, in a sense, uh, ripped up its own uh, fiscal rules without putting in place new rules. So that doesn't really help confidence. So why they do it? Well, I think they did it in part because this is a government that is, um, in a sense, uh, more ideologically driven than the Johnson government. The Johnson government was entirely obsessed by politics and short-term political calculations. This government appears to be more ideologically driven. I think they do genuinely believe that their efforts, as yet unspecified, on deregulation, on supply-side reforms, that they will, over time, raise the growth rate of the UK economy. That is, at best, unproven. Um, but, but really, the, 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 the thing that is, um, I think, taken markets by surprise is how politically naive some of their announcements have been in the middle of a cost of living crisis to cut taxes for the wealthy, to scrap um, limits to banker, bankers' bonuses. That just looks politically hard to sustain. So I, I, I think that's, there's an element of credibility there which is just lacking in, in the early um, policy stance that's been adopted by this government. Tim Bale, expl explain it for our viewers uh, internationally, because you, you heard there uh, Greg Irwin talking about things like bankers' bonuses, uh, which in this country is the political third rail. Uh, why did they do it? Why did they double down? Well, I think Greg was right to say that this is a deeply ideological government. I think both uh, Kwasi Kwarteng and Liz Truss are market fundamentalists, uh, to be honest. Uh, they really do believe that by deregulating and by cutting taxes, they can massively boost the growth rate in this country, and that will eventually pay for uh, public services. But I think you also have to go back, actually, to Brexit and the reasons why Brexit occurred. For some in the Conservative Party, and I think Kwarteng would have been among them, uh, but there are many others, Brexit was, in the end, all about shucking off the regulations supposedly imposed on the UK economy uh, by the EU. It was all about the UK being able to uh, forge its own course to become, if you like, a sort of buccaneering country in global markets. And finally, uh, those people have got control of uh, the Conservative government and are determined to, as it were, see through that experiment. And I think that is what we're seeing right now. How much support do they have within their own ranks? Well, I mean, if you look at the number of MPs who voted for Liz Truss in the first stage of the Conservative leadership contest, uh, you'd have to say only a third of Conservative MPs are convinced uh, that she is the right person for the job, that leaves two thirds of people on the Conservative benches not at all sure about Liz Truss. And clearly, during the leadership contest, her main opponent, Rishi Sunak, made it very clear that some of the things that she was suggesting and that she has just implemented along with Quirtain would actually cause a run on the pound, would actually cause uh, interest rates to rise very precipitately, and would cause the kind of financial crisis that uh, we are now seeing. The fact was, however, uh, that Rishi Sunak wasn't particularly popular among MPs either. He was seen as someone who had knifed Boris Johnson in the back and, and therefore was responsible for the fall of Boris Johnson. So we had a situation in which neither contender was particularly popular, which means it's actually going to be quite difficult, I think, for the Conservatives to uh, immediately replace Liz Truss. And some people are already talking about the need for her to resign. Uh, Jake Scott. Uh, you agree uh, that uh, no matter what happens now, Liz Truss uh, will limp on till the next election, most likely, at least for now? I think that because there's only, as I said last time I was on, there's only 18 months left between this 
uh, period in time in the next general election, I don't think the Conservatives would risk another uh, leadership contest. Of course, that being said, one of the things that the Conservative Party is very good at is turning on leaders that are proving to be unpopular. The, the popularity of Liz Truss is yet to be really asserted. I, there was a poll I saw that said she was mildly more popular amongst Red Wall voters than Keir Starmer, but that's not really saying much. Um, I, th I think she's probably going to hold on between now and 2024. But I don't. I, I. I just don't. I'd like to agree with uh, with with Tim and Gregor in the sense that this is a, a an ideologically driven uh, cabinet. But the other thing to bear in mind is the Conservative Party has been in government for ten years to twelve years, in which time they basically abandoned all principles in favour of, as Tim says, market fundamentalism, and that's the sort of thing that. Actually, Brexit voters largely were, were not in favour of. You know, if you look at um, opinion polls by uh, Lord Ashcroft and, and research by, say, David Goodhart or Anon Manon, there was, there was a significant uh, demand for a, a restructuring of the economy. Certainly not in this way. <laughs> a, a, a restructuring of the economy that actually addressed material concerns of voters. And I just don't think that this is doing that. So they, what you're saying is, is that Brexit voters, they wanted a state that protects, not deregulation? Yeah, and the other thing to bear in mind is that if you look at the countries around the world, Britain is one of the most deregulated economies already. The idea that we can cut to the bone even further is is laughable, really. Um, the, the, the fact that this is just, as, as Tim said, market fundamentalism is not popular amongst voters. Voters don't want uh, essentially more well-off people already rewarded. They want support, especially, as the reporter said, at a time when living costs are just rising. Yeah, uh, let's, let's look at that IMF statement that came out on Wednesday. It warned against, uh, quote, large and untargeted fiscal packages uh, given the elevated inflation pressures in many countries at this juncture, the statement, by the way, goes on to say that uh, these measures will likely increase uh, inequality. Uh, and it's important for fiscal policy not to work at cross purposes to monetary policy. Uh, we love Catherine Mathieu to invite economists on to ask him about politics. So what's this all about? <laughs> You mean the IMF statement? No, but the, the the fact that here what the IMF is saying is that the this is at cross purposes with sound economic policy. So why is she doing it? Ah, because as was said already by a, a few speakers, uh, uh, there is a clear ideological. Uh, uh, policy which is being implemented by Liz Truss and Kwasi Kwarteng at the moment. It was clear from the start, from August, that Liz Truss would like to conduct a very supply-side oriented policy. And it was clear also she wouldn't want to explain how she would fund the tax cuts she was going to implement and uh, the energy price guarantee also, which she had agreed uh, to launch. So we are now with the UK economy having something like two... 200 billion pounds uh, gone in tax cuts and uh, price guarantee support without knowing how this is going to be funded. And I think this is one of the main uncertainties which explain why currently markets and also the IMF has stepped in to say, well, OK, you are going, you are conducting a, a policy. We don't know how this is going to be funded. It also Another point is that this policy is going to bring tax cuts to the um, wealthy people, wealthier people. So there are several elements in the strategy which are very criticized, both by most economists and by the IMF. And so uh, to me, what is striking is why this uh, new UK government decided to announce so many tax cuts without saying how they would fund it. And that's how they created the uncertainty we, ha we are in today. Well, let me put that question to Tim Bale then. Uh, Tim, the, the, is it possible, let me play devil's advocate here, is it possible that uh, because UK politics is fractured right now, if you calculate that you've got yourself a hard core of people who are energized uh, and radical, that uh, you can get what you want? 
Well, I mean, I think some Conservatives believe that that is the case, just as, for example, some people in the Labour Party under Jeremy Corbyn believe that that was the case. But frankly, if you look at the distribution of voters in the UK, most of them are, or describe themselves anyway, as in the centre. Uh, they're not really, as Jake said, up for this kind of uh, policy change. Uh, they want a reasonably pragmatic, reasonably centrist, and, as you said, reasonably uh, protective uh, government, that they're really not on for this kind of supply side revolution. Uh, there just simply aren't enough voters uh, who believe in this kind of stuff. I mean, if you if you look at sort of you know clusters of British voters, it's literally fewer than ten percent are kind of market fundamentalists themselves. So the Conservative Party, or at least Liz Truss and Kwesi Kwarteng, are, are out of line with most voters and even most Conservative voters. And if you look at the electoral coalition that Boris Johnson put together in 2019, yes, there would have been some uh, people who were up for this kind of thing, but they would have been a very small minority, concentrated mainly in probably quite safe seats that the Conservatives would win anyway. They certainly wouldn't be in the kind of seats that the Conservatives managed to flip from Labour uh, uh, a couple of years ago. So I, I really don't think that this um, this policy has, has got a, a cat's chance in hell, actually, of uh, attracting enough uh, electors to give the Conservatives a majority at the next election. I think they'll be doing very well, actually, to uh, emerge as the largest party. And certainly, if you look at current polling, with Labour between 15 and 20 per cent ahead, um, the, the Conservative Party is going to suffer some kind of meltdown unless it actually does something about this particular package. And I think we will, and the economists may um, uh, say a little bit more about this, see a combination of U-turns and, I'm afraid, public spending cuts. And that won't help uh, the Conservatives in uh, these so-called red wall seats in the North and the Midlands of the UK that they desperately need to hang on to. Uh, Jake Scott, we were in London uh, on the day of the Brexit uh, referendum back then. Uh, the ones who were the most vociferously uh, in uh, hardcore pro-Brexit were still on the fringes of the Conservative Party, people like Jacob Rees-Mogg. Uh, today, they seem to be, have, be at the center of the party. Again, you agree with Tim Bale that uh, uh, it's impossible it won't fly, or is that who controls the Conservative Party today? That is who controls the Conservative Party today. But I also think that that won't fly, either with voters, as Tim rightly says, or, and I think, as, as has not really been discussed so far, most Conservative Party members. The, the reality of the Conservative Party membership is that the vast majority are not market fundamentalists, at least not on this scale. You know, that you have to remember that there is a scale here, and the, the level to which the, this government has gone is unprecedented since the 70s. And one thing... I think we have to try and remember is that in the long view of the Conservative Party, they are broadly seen as the fiscally responsible party. The fact that now you have the Bank of England and the IMF saying this is not fiscally responsible is going to completely demolish that reputation, which, which essentially means what is there for the Conservatives to offer when it comes to the next election? And as I've, as I've heard from a lot of people that I speak to, a lot of people are saying, well, I'm prepared to give Labour another chance now. And you have to remember, again, after 2008, Labour was seen as completely fiscally irresponsible. And it might now be that there's a sort of reversal of the roles that maybe actually, you know, the, the, the Labour Party might not be seen as this complete answer, but at least they're slightly more responsible than the Conservatives have been. And that will really, really affect the way people vote in the next election. Greg Irwin, we can show the cover of The Spectator, not exactly a left-wing publication. Uh, it, too, is turning on the, the prime minister. Uh, what crisis? And there you see uh, uh, Kwasi Kwarten, the, the finance minister, and, and the prime minister sitting there in the middle of uh, what looks like total mayhem. Uh, what's your reaction to that? Well, I, I think what it reflects, actually, is a remarkable um, silence from uh, both the Chancellor and the Prime Minister over the past couple of days, that there is this crisis engulfing the government. Uh, they are very obviously at the centre of it, but they're not communicating particularly well uh, either to markets or, or, or to the wider population. We had a single statement from the Chancellor uh, yesterday uh, where he set out a timeline 
uh, for making further announcements on his fiscal plan uh, with an OBER uh, forecast, an Office of Budget Responsibility independent forecast uh, for uh, the fiscal outlook. Uh, but apart from that, we've heard nothing. I mean, we haven't heard anything from Liz Truss. And I think that's actually, that is most definitely unsustainable. In a crisis, communication by uh, leaders really matters. And I think we will need to hear from uh, both the Chancellor and uh, the Prime Minister very soon about exactly how they intend to, to get us out of this mess. And there's been lots of crises in the past. Uh, uh, we think of 2008, the most recent one. Of course, it was 1992, the so-called Black Wednesday, where the likes of billionaire investor George Soros uh, shorted uh, sterling. It's the 30th anniversary of... Uh, uh, of that run on the pound. Uh, Catherine Mathieu, when you look at those images, what, how different is it from, from, from then when you see the pound now flirting with these new lows? It's different in the sense that it's really um, due to uh, measures which were announced by the UK government itself. So that's why this is such a shock also, I, I assume, for markets. So, okay, Well, you have a new government. You knew, knew, know it's going to be uh, supply-side-oriented. But you don't expect the government just to talk about tax cuts and then to tell you that there will be an independent forecast by the OBR only in a, ten, in a two months' time, so, and a budget published in a two months' time by the 23rd of November. So it's just, OK, for two months, what are markets and other economic agents going to expect about the economic policy which is going to be uh, implemented in the UK? So to me... What is really surprising and different from the previous crisis is that it comes itself from the way the government has communicated. The way it's communicated, what we just heard as well there from from uh, from uh, uh, Gregor, critics of trust point to what they see as an opening salvo, which was the sacking earlier this month of veteran high civil servant uh, Tom Scholar. Uh, the dismissal of the permanent Treasury Secretary, seen as a move to sidelining uh, dissenting voices. Uh, Gregor Irwin, get, fill us in on this, because here in France, the high civil service is, is, is like uh, mandarins, is what we sometimes call them. Uh, it, this sacking, why, is it, was it really a big deal? Um, yeah, it was a big deal, but, but actually it's, it's, it's a number of similar, it, it comes in the back of other similar signals that we've had from the government that are concerning. So, um, uh, you know, um, Tom Scholar is a highly respected Treasury official. He was a key person during the 2008 financial crisis. He played a leading role in setting out the UK government's response uh, then. He's held a number of uh, top jobs across government. Um, the Chancellor appeared to object to him because he regarded him as being um, uh, the, the epitome of Treasury orthodoxy. And very clearly, um, he, he wants to challenge that orthodoxy, and he does not want civil servants getting in the way of him making the sort of announcement that he made on Friday. Uh, but very clearly now, I think we can see that that is exactly what uh, would have helped him to have uh, a cautionary uh, voice um, uh, advising him about the market reaction and suggesting uh, a more moderate approach. It does come in the back of some other um, similar um, uh, stances taken by the government that, that I do think are problematic. For example, questioning um, the mandates of the Bank of England, insisting on having twice weekly meetings with the Bank of England. The Chancellor has done that. That is a threat to the Bank of England's independence not allowing the Office of, the, of Budget Responsibility to set, uh, to set out its forecast for the UK economy after the statement that was made by the Chancellor uh, on, on Friday. The, this all adds up to uh, a government which is um, uh, really sort of ripping up some quite important rules, and, and that in itself is also damaging to the government's own credibility. So, Tim Bale, this might shock, of course, the... Uh... The, as we sometimes call the chattering classes, but uh, is that sound populist politics, taking on the, the bureaucracy, taking on the civil service? Uh, her predecessor, Boris Johnson, uh, when he prorogued Parliament, trying to test the limits of how much power you have. 
Well, I think you're right to use the P word. I mean, this is all of a piece in some ways with um, the government that we've had since 2016, which has rather denigrated the idea of expertise, which has chosen to um, pit itself and supposedly the people against some kind of elite, some kind of blob that is um, preventing the government from carrying out common sense policies or radical policies as, as it would see it. So I think it's very much in uh, a continuum, really. Um, clearly, I think Gregor's absolutely right, however, if you sack your uh, senior Treasury civil servant before you've even met him um, because you believe that, you know, he's going to be obstructive, then, you know, you're asking for trouble. Uh, and as Gregor says, that's the purpose, in some sense, is of the civil service, to stop ministers doing things that might otherwise uh, be, be seen, particularly, obviously, in the, as far as the Treasury is concerned, by the markets, as, as crazy. And I, I honestly don't think that Scholar or, indeed, the Office for Budget Responsibility would, would have allowed this to happen. If, if the OBR had been able to publish a report, I think the government would have realised that they would have to row back on some of their ambitions. And I think if Tom Scholar had been there, he would have told it like it is to Kwasi Kwarteng, and he would have had to, I think, modulate some of the uh, programme that he wanted to deliver on Friday. So this is really, I, I think, in some ways, uh, uh, an advert for a neutral uh, and robust civil service and another warning against populism. Well, Gregor Irwin is right. We have not heard from uh, Liz Truss on this uh, since last Friday when the pound went south. Uh, we did hear from her last week. She was in New York at the annual gathering of world leaders at the United Nations. The uh, new UK prime minister seemed to strike a Thatcherite tone when she was asked if her policies amounted to a choice between bankers and struggling families. What I want to see is a growing economy so everybody in our country has the high paid jobs that they deserve, that the investment into their town or city or, or area, the new business is being set up. That's the kind of Britain that I want to see. And if, that and if that means taking difficult decisions which are going to help Britain become more competitive, help Britain become more attractive, help more investment flow into our country, Yes, I'm absolutely prepared to take those decisions. Jake Scott, when you listen back to that, your thoughts? One thing I think is worth pointing out is that this is populist in a certain regard. But one thing that people often forget about populism is it's not just the elites. There is often a elite versus elite element to that. And one thing that we've seen consistently from this is that there's a certain overture to a specific kind of elite, which isn't an economic elite. And the idea that this is not an attractive country to do business in is, is, is strange to me. This is quite a robust country. It has a decent economy. It has very good financial services. I don't understand why we're appealing to one elite. And as, as Tim rightly pointed out, and as you pointed out, putting down another elite, which is the institutional uh, civil service. Um, as I say, th this is a good country to do business in. And at a certain point, we have to ask the question of, is growth really the answer? Obviously, growth matters. But if this is a country that's already good to do business in, that's already got a certain degree of growth, uh, you know, granted, we've had two years now of, of crisis in terms of the COVID crisis, which has hampered growth. But broadly speaking, it's been it's not been a bad decade. Um, how can growth be the key, the silver bullet? And I don't, again, going back to the electoral sale of this, I just don't think that voters are going to buy that. Catherine Mathieu, are there cautionary tales for the French here or for uh, some other European nations? Uh, to me, uh, the big surprise is that uh, we have a country where which is already a very um, deregulated country, uh, which has done a lot to attract investment, to attract banking, and so on. And to hear the government saying in the UK today, we are going to do more to make the UK attractive is very, a very strange, a very weird uh, message. Um, I would have expected rather the UK um, government in general to say, OK, well, we have uh, structural points to, to improve. We have the NHS to... Uh, to, which is in need of more resources. We need to level up, which was part of the agenda of the previous cover, um, conservative government. So there is a need to put more money 
in the UK economy, also in terms of education, in terms of jobs. So um, it's really uh, strange <laughs> from uh, from my perspective uh, to hear that what the UK is in need of is of more uh, deregulation to have more higher growth. The objective of having a 2.5% growth, okay, I, I can understand it. That was the trend growth before the crisis, uh, before the pandemics. That's fine as such. But why should it be reached only via uh, cutting taxes and not via uh, putting more uh, resources in terms of the infrastructure in the education? That's a big question mark. Are, are we being too nice here? Is this really about ideology or is it about helping out rich friends? <laughs> I would say both, if I can be <laughs> diplomatic. It's, I think it's really, uh, there, there is this big ideology, at least when you hear to, uh, when you listen to Liz Truss for a while now, and this kind of satirite image, which she wants um, to show that, okay, well, we need to be the less regulated uh, economy. But while Thatcher could say that, uh, more than 40 years ago, uh, today the situation of the UK economy is totally different. It's much more deregulated. So what more can you do? Yeah, Margaret Thatcher, who uh, was a prime minister who faced high inflation, made uh, unpopular decisions when she came to power. But she was not an outlier. Her years coincided with the two terms of Ronald Reagan, a U.S. president who broke the unions and went all in with supply side economics. And there's was a strong alliance uh, today. And, you know, last week at UN Week, Tim Bale, uh, uh, there was a sit down with uh, Joe Biden that went well because there were no uh, uh, there were no uh, uh, barbs traded across the room. But uh, Liz Blunt uh, is uh, Liz Truss, excuse me, is is hardly uh, got the uh, the ear of this current White House. So if you've left the European Union, and you don't have the ear of Washington, how does it work? Well, uh, quite probably it doesn't. I mean, there are some real problems in the relationship between the UK and the US right now. In particular, obviously, the Northern Ireland Protocol. Joe Biden, being of Irish extraction, um, is particularly worried, I think, by uh, Liz Truss's um, supposed attempt to try and solve the uh, GBNI trade issue by uh, possibly breaking international law and, as he sees it, um, possibly even endangering um, the, the Belfast Agreement. Uh, so she's going to have to tread very, very carefully there. The problem for her, of course, is that uh, on her back benches there are many um, hardline Brexiteers, Brexiteer ultras, if you like, who will insist on carrying on um, that very aggressive stance on Northern Ireland, um, partly because they believe that, you know, the, the EU still wants to uh, have far more influence in uh, the UK than it should have. So she's she's in a very, very difficult position there. I think as far as the, the connection with Margaret Thatcher goes, I think we do have to stress that they are very, very different uh, in terms of their approach. Margaret Thatcher is remembered in the Conservative Party as someone who deregulated and who cut taxes. But it's very important to remember, and I'm sure Gregor will... Um, emphasize this as well, that Margaret Thatcher actually, uh, in the first couple of years, did some tax cuts, but she also raised some taxes. She was all about balancing the budget before uh, you could actually uh, go ahead with some of the, the, the stuff that became known as, as Thatcherism. She was very different in that respect from Ronald Reagan, who, who really did uh, let borrowing take the strain and didn't worry too much about the deficit. As he said, it's big enough to take care of itself. But, of course, you can do that if you uh, are uh, operating in the USA with a huge reserve currency. We're not in that situation uh, in the UK. So I think a part of Liz Truss's problem is a kind of misremembering uh, in the Conservative Party uh, of what Mrs Thatcher did and, and what she was about. And I would also say, looking at that clip of Liz Truss uh, and going back to what Gregor say, was saying about the need to communicate, I think one of the problems, of course, is that Liz Truss is really not one of life's natural communicators. Jake Scott, uh, if you're uh, going to uh, uh, forge a new path, uh, listening to Catherine Mathieu, listening there to Tim Bale, uh, is it time to stop the referencing to Margaret Thatcher? Absolutely. 
I said the last time I was on, this is an entirely different country to what it was in 1979 because of Margaret Thatcher. You can't, for good or bad, you can't get over that. Um, but the, Sorry, you can't get around that. But the fact that the Conservative Party can't get over that is is extraordinarily worrying. There's When, when you look forward to the... Um, to the agenda for next week, bearing in mind, of course, Sunday is the Conservative Party conference launch. Um, there's a lot on the agenda about what would Margaret Thatcher do? How can we reinstate Thatcherite economics? How can we get back to the 80s? All these sorts of things. And it, this this malaise is not just on the front benches. It's, it's probably institutionalised now. There's such a hero worship of Margaret Thatcher and what she did. And, you know, again, from, from the Conservative perspective, for good reason. But the idea that you can resurrect Thatcher in 2022 is is dangerous and importantly, as Tim says, is um, is based on a misremembering. So again, you know the, the the fact that until 1981 Thatcher was very kind of you know steady as she goes and and then really started to get the privatisation project underway is is the, the fact that this is like two weeks into Liz Truss's government, three weeks, and she's gone straight for straight for the jugular, essentially, on the economy. Um, you know, we, we, we can't we have to be careful that there are um, caricatures of Thatcher that we're trying to draw connections to uh, as opposed to the reality. And, and do you think that uh, this is purely ideology or uh, what what else is it behind going for, as you put it, the jugular? As I say, I think there's a certain degree of populism, um, but also, and, and, and Tim mentioned this, but it was actually something that, that he retweeted on Twitter earlier today, was that this country has been behaving as if it's the United States for a good while now. And it's not. Our economy is nowhere near the same size. We don't have anywhere near the same population. We're a, we're a constitutionally different country, as the last four, uh, two weeks have shown us. Um, I, I, I think, personally... There's an ideological element to this, a sort of uh, a kind of leaning back on Thatcherism as a, as a go to. But as I said at the beginning, I actually think that the reality is this is an ideologically bereft party, one that's been in government for too long to the extent where it's it's actually reversing the policies of previous cabinets. You have to remember part of the um, tax cut program is undoing the NI rise. You know, th this is a party that is at lost, is lost at sea. It has no ideological direction. And well, you mentioned the fact that there's going to be uh, this uh, pa uh, party conference uh, coming up for the Tories uh, at the weekend. The Labour's just staged uh, there in Liverpool and uh, the opposition leader uh, got his licks in in his keynote speech. The government has lost control of the British economy. And for what? They've crashed the pound. And for what? Higher interest rates, higher inflation, higher borrowing. And for what? Not for you, not for working people, for tax cuts for the richest 1% in our society. So, Gregor Irwin, uh, we, we mentioned it earlier in this conversation, right now, Labour riding high in the polls. Uh, but of course, a lot can happen. Has it sorted out where it wants to go, or is there still that huge divide within the opposition uh, between the Jeremy Corbyn side and the Keir Starmer side? Well, I, I, it certainly appears to me that Keir Starmer is now firmly in control of his party. There's nothing uh, that helps to unify a party more than to see um, the government in disarray uh, and Labour certainly... Because right, right now we're seeing a period where there's a lot of industrial action. There have been a lot of strikes recently. And there was Keir Starmer uh, causing some grumbling within his own ranks by uh, telling members of Parliament not to be seen too much at uh, union rallies. Yeah, so I think, I think that's, that, that's been a very difficult issue for Keir Starmer. Um, he was certainly sending a signal to the wider population that he doesn't stand with the strikers, that he stands with the people who are feeling the destruction caused by those strikes. And that is a very unpopular message uh, within uh, the Labour Party. But but I, I, I think the argument that he has always presented to the Labour Party has been that this is what you need to do if you want to get elected. And, and right now, he's in a very favourable position in terms of his um, electability and the chances of Labour winning the next election. So I, give, I think that gives him 
a great deal more authority within his party. Of course, we, you know, we saw some uh, indications from him about what his policy platform will look like. Uh, he's been very clear about which of the tax cuts he will reverse, certainly the tax cuts uh, for higher earners, uh, the corporation tax cuts, uh, but he's willing to um, follow the conservative policy of reducing the basic rate of, of income tax. He will need to do more to set out his policy uh, platform uh, if he's really to present himself as, as, a, as a credible uh, future prime minister with a real plan to get the UK out of the malaise that it, that it currently risks finding itself in uh, if uh, some of the market turmoil that was seen uh, in recent days is, is not addressed by this government. So he, he is going to have to be more specific over the course of the next few months about his solution to these problems. Okay, so Liz Truss trying to channel uh, Margaret Thatcher is Keir Starmer trying to channel Tony Blair when you hear Gregor Irwin there, Catherine Mathieu, talk about tax cuts. Yes, that, that's clear. In a three years' time, there has been a shift in the Conservative Party from the wing with Boris Johnson and other uh, members of the cabinet, which had a more social approach in terms of um, raising the minimum wage, in terms of leveling up, in terms of the NHS, in terms of dealing with climate change. And in a three years' time, after a huge uh, performance in terms of uh, um, results in the legislative ele elections. Now we have a government which is totally on the right side of uh, the agenda, while on the Labour side we have also a shift on the centre from Corbyn to Starmer. And when you hear Starmer, you say, OK, well, we are back to the times of Tony Blair, where we, you are um, you have um, um, a party uh, which is in favour of being fiscally responsible, of uh, making very uh, reasonable things, and as you were saying a few minutes uh, ago, not supporting too, mo too much the trade unions who are uh, striking uh, for better uh, working conditions. So you, we have clearly a shift in, in terms of the political parties uh, in the UK, and this is a chance now for Keir Starmer to to have a chance to win uh, in the next elections from uh, from France, I would wonder whether Liz Truss is going to be able to remain until 2024, where the next elections are supposed to take place, or, or she, if she ha she will have to to resign earlier. And of course, Tim Bale, uh, you were mentioning earlier how the UK doesn't have the kind of market that the United States does. It could if it joined a club we have on this side of the channel called the European Union. <laughs> yeah, I thought you might bring that up. I mean, I just can't see that happening, um, at least for a generation now. I think um, the Labour Party is unwilling to, to touch that, um, that issue. Uh, it's just too uh, enervating, I think, for some of its supporters. Um, the Conservative Party certainly isn't going to row back on Brexit. So... Uh, I, I don't think we'll be rejoining. I think there is a serious possibility under a Labour government that we will try to forge a closer relationship with Europe. Um, I'm not saying that we could go to EEA membership, the sort of Norway style, but I think we could come somewhere uh, near to that. The problem, of course, is always British people's feelings about immigration. But, of course, one of the fascinating things about the post-Brexit era is that immigration is just no longer as important to voters as it used to be. They seem to have um, concluded that we now have taken back control. And even though immigration hasn't really been reduced, and even though uh, migration from the European Union has been replaced uh, by migration from, for example, South Asia and West Africa and, and indeed the Caribbean, um, uh, British people no longer seem to have such a problem with it. So it could even be that in the medium term, something like EEA membership might be possible. All right, we shall see. In any case, uh, there's this uh, current storm to get through. Uh, Tim Bale, I want to thank you so much for joining us uh, from Eastbourne, Gregor Irwin in Glasgow, Jake Scott in Birmingham, Catherine Mathieu, thank you for being with us here in the France 24 debate.